Hey everyone, today we're going to talk about IV therapy and some general um, guidelines in order to administer meds, start an IV line, and even how to change it out. <clears throat> IV therapy is generally used to help give medications. It will replace fluids that may be lost for the patient, or also you can use it for blood transfusions. Um, some guidelines that you have to that you need to follow for any of these skills that I'm about to go over is before any of the procedures you want to verify the IV order in their medication charts their medical records however your facility does record keeping you also want to verify that the medical order matches what you're looking at and what you're getting ready to do check expiration dates of any of the solution or medications that you're going to administer including the clarity the color and if there's any leaking of the product you may also want to review allergies that are in the chart along with when you go to ask your patient like their name and date of birth you might want to ask them again just in case something was missed <clears throat> you also want to gather your supplies most supplies are sometimes in a kit um, but if they're not you'll have things like the IV catheter or the needle which is usually a 20 or 18 gauge needle the tourniquet which you can also use a blood pressure cuff I found that out not too long ago in case the you have an elderly patient who has really thin skin or if you have just a patient that has really stubborn veins that the blood pressure cuff can do the same thing um, you'll also have a dressing or like a bandage to put over your IV insertion site, tape, saline flush, and even a cleanser for the skin such as chlorhexidine. <clears throat> you don't want to use alcohol because um, they say that once you pierce the skin, the alcohol will um, actually make them bleed more and also it will burn at the site. <clears throat> You also want to perform hand hygiene by washing your hands or using a hand sanitizer given on the situation and use any other PPE if indicated such as a gown, mask, gloves, and so on. <clears throat> Anytime before you give a solution or a medication, if you are unsure of any of the information about it, be sure you look it up. <clears throat> Things that you should know for the medications would be what it does, how it works, um, adverse effects, any nursing considerations like can you give med B with med C and so on. <clears throat> you also before you perform these procedures you want to make sure you've identified your patient, ask them their name, date of birth, um, you can even look at their ID bands, scan bars, whatever your facility is. You also want to be sure that when you're setting up your supplies that they are on the bedside table or on another surface that is within reach of you and, and not necessarily the patient. Make it more comfortable for you. <clears throat> um, another thing you also if they are in a shared room be sure you pull those curtains just to provide more privacy for the patient. It makes it a little bit more comfortable for them. <clears throat> um, the first skill to go over today is how to initiate a venous access. After you have gone through all these previous steps that I just mentioned, um, such as making sure you have the right solution, the right med, patient, you're going to carefully open any solution packaging that you have. Um, just be sure you don't drop it. You don't want to get it dirty. <clears throat> um, some of these containers have a place that you can fill out like the name, your birth, not the birthday, excuse me, but like the date, your name, and time because sometimes these things have to be changed out. If there's not, there should be a label that you can fill out with this information. <clears throat> if you need IV tubing, you also want to remove that from the packaging and apply the label as per policy of your facility. <clears throat> Before you attach this tubing to the solution container, you want to close any roller clamps that is on the tubing because you don't want it to leak before you're ready to use it. 
So you're going to remove the cap of an entry site of the solution and then get ready to spike the bag. And what they mean by spike the bag, the tubing should have a needle-like end on it that goes in into the bag. And like it literally you you push and twist and it attaches the tubing to the bag. <clears throat> then you're going to hang this IV solution on the IV pole. And if it doesn't start to automatically drip into the drip chamber, you can squeeze it just a little bit to where the chamber is half full. Actually, most places recommend that you do this anyway, just to help it get ready to flow. Any of those roller clamps that you had closed, you now want to open. And this will allow fluid to flow through. Um, if you're using an, an IV pump or an infusion pump, you'll just follow the directions of the manufacturer on that. <clears throat> Put your patient in the low Fowler's position. But I, this is after you would put the bed up to a comfortable working height for you because you don't want to strain your back. Um, <clears throat> then once they're in a comfortable position, you're going to want to put a towel or like a disposable pad under their arm. Usually you're going to use the non-dominant arm or hand. This is just to make it more comfortable for the patient. <clears throat> Excuse me. Once you've done this, you're then going to open the extension package and a connect, a, excuse me, attach connector pieces to end caps. Any of these end caps, though, before you actually place them on, you're going to want to clean them with either alcohol or other antimicrobial swabs. And then you're also going to connect a saline flush to one of those um, end caps. Excuse me. And then place within reach. <clears throat> Once you've done this, now it's time for you to select and look for a good vein. So, I'm trying to use my wrist here. <laughs> um, so, what you're going to want to do is just kind of like feel along the area that you're wanting to use for the vein. Or even like on the thing, on my hand here. And once you feel like you've got a pretty good vein... You're going to want to get ready to put on gloves, put on the tourniquet. Now, the way to put on the tourniquet is you're going to want to put it about four to six inches above the entry site that you're wanting to use for the infusion. <clears throat> the reason for this is it'll help cause the vein to kind of plump up, to, but you're going to make sure that you still have a pulse because you don't want to cut off circulation. You may even ask your patient to open and close their hand a little bit, or you can apply a warm compress if you need further help to dilate. <clears throat> then you'll cleanse the site with the chlorhexidine or other facility cleanser and allow it to dry for 30 seconds. <clears throat> so, and then to get ready to actually pierce the patient, you're going to, with your non-dominant hand, hold your the skin taut for or excuse me for at about one to two inches below your entry site so if i'm wanting to put it say i'm gonna put my insertion site here i'm gonna hold the skin taut right about here <clears throat> that just helps it stabilize the vein and keeps it from moving <clears throat> and ask your patient to please remain still at all possible <clears throat> excuse me with the catheter or the iv needle however you word it, you're going to have the bevel side up, which is the opening of the needle, and at a 15 to 10 to 15 degree angle, excuse me, or some places even say 15 to 30, just kind of depending on the location of the vein and also what their policies are, you're going to gently follow the vein and you're going to pierce the skin. <clears throat> Once you can see flood in the fla uh, blood in the flashback chamber, you want to remove your tourniquet and activate any kind of safety mechanisms that may be on the stylet or catheter. <clears throat> um, the next step would be to stabilize your catheter and pull back gently, just a little bit, just to allow proper blood return. And then you're going to flush it with that saline flush that was already attached. 
and of course remove it after pretty much any time you use a saline flush you take it off right away and discard it <clears throat> um, use a skin protectant at this point on the patient just to help like it says just to help protect their skin from any of the adhesive or anything that may be irritating to them um, so say the insertion site's here. I'm going to put that skin protectant just around that area. And maybe even a little bit like on the outer edges of where the bandage would be. <clears throat> Whew, excuse me. Then you will just put a piece of dressing over it. Usually it's a clear dressing. I believe it's kind of like a tegaderm or a duoderm. I, I get the two mixed up. Um, but any kind of clear bandage that will kind of hold it in place, but you can still visualize it that way. If you need to come check on it, you can see if there, if it's moved, it has any kind of redness or swelling, anything like that. <clears throat> um, you also want to tape down the, any kind of tubing that may be attached to the insertion site because you're just kind of prepping them for a future infusion. And you just do this with tape. <clears throat> you kind of anchor it down. You also want to label this with the date, the time, what the site is in case it comes out for some reason, the type and size of catheter, um, and it, whenever you have to do this each time that it's changed or any time that it comes out. <clears throat> you also, after the patient has been you know put comfortably in this that you want to watch to make sure they're not having any kind of redness or swelling pain you know ask them how they're doing after you've performed the procedure then once this is all said and done you're going to attach that tubing to the tubing on the IV pole and begin your infusion or use the pump however your facility says after about 30 to 65, 60 minutes, excuse me, you're going to want to come back and just kind of check on your patient again to verify the placement, make sure it hasn't moved, that it's not bleeding or leaking or anything like that. And also um, a, a technique to remember is any kind of open ports along the tubing, be sure you have the cap, uh, like a cap on it. That just helps prevent infection and any kind of bugs getting in, if you will. <clears throat> um, to change the solution, you, you would want to pause or hold the infusion device if you're using one and close any roller clamps to prevent fluid from flowing. Then you're going to want to remove the cap of your entry site of the new solution like you did before. However, be sure you do not touch. <laughs> we don't want to touch it. You're going to take the old solution bag off the pole. Quickly remove that spike. Throw the old bag away and reinsert the spike into the new bag. It's pretty much the same thing that you did before in the previous comments. Again, follow manufacturer directions on any of this or any kind of policy procedures. <clears throat> Attach it to the pump, open the clamp, hit run, be sure it's on the correct flow rate, and just kind of check on your patient once it's all said and done. In order to change the administration set or even the tubing, you want to remove from the pump after you've paused it. Be sure you pause and clamp <laughs> at any time before you move anything. Otherwise, you will probably have a pretty good mess. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then once you've removed the tubing, you're going to place the new piece into the pump while wearing gloves. Remove from any kind of connectors to the patient. You're going to clean any of these sites of the tubing um, just to prevent infection, you know, septic technique here. And you, again, you're going to attach it to the connector site to the patient, loop it around with tape like you did before, anchor it down, anything you can do to make it comfortable for the patient, open your clamps, and run your pump. Again, it... That, I think once you get into the habit, it's kind of 
Not necessarily self-explanatory, but it'll become second nature to you. And at any of these procedures, be sure your patient is comfortable once you're done, that their bed is as low as possible, call bells within reach, that kind of stuff. Um, a few things to remember with IV solutions is you're going to want to monitor the IV site and or the infusion itself. So you're going to want to check the tubing for any kinks, make sure the clamps are open, is the dressing leaking, is the patient bleeding, anything like that. And if so, you're going to want to, you know, take care of that. <laughs> you also want to check settings on the pump to make sure nothing has changed since you've last been in there. Make sure the flow rate is correct per the doctor's orders, um, that you can visibly see flow through the tube, just anything. At the IV insertion site, you also want to inspect the patient to see if they have any swelling, redness, um, is it warm to touch, anything like that, or is it uncomfortable. If any of those things are present, you will need to remove the insertion and restart it somewhere else. Um, you also want to notify your, the doctor that you've had to move it or take it out, stop it, um, just so that they are aware. <clears throat> um, a few things to be alert for would be fluid volume overload which could include any kind of cardiac or respiratory distress, and definitely you want to be alert for bleeding because, you know, we don't want them to bleed out for whatever reason. A few complications of IV infusion include infiltration, phlebitis, and even hem hematoma, which is an ecchymosis at the insertion site. If your patient's experienced in any of these, like I mentioned before, just stop the infusion, Notify the doctor, wait to see what they say, and also, you know, be sure you make the patient comfortable. <clears throat> when you are ready to change the site dressing, not necessarily the, the catheter itself, but just the dressing, because I believe most facilities recommend that you change any of these parts every 72 hours, which is every three days. <clears throat> So you're going to gather any kind of equipment that you may need, such as the dressing, skin protectant, cleanser even. Um, you're going to perform hand hygiene, identify your patient, identify yourself if, they're, if they've not met you before, ask if they have any allergies, and again, close curtains for privacy. Um, much like you've done before when you initiated the access site, you're going to apply gloves, Put a towel or a, a disposable pad under their arm at the site and temporarily hold the infusion if you're using a pump. So you're going to pause the pump, roll the clamps, make sure they're closed, all that good stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. So with your non-dominant hand, you're going to hold the catheter and you're going to like hold it in place. And then with your dominant hand, you'll gently move take the tape or the the bandage if you will the old dressing and kind of try to roll it to the center but and hold their skin taut so that way it doesn't hurt as much because some of these little old ladies that have really frail skin you can easily tear their skin by removing this <clears throat> but also you want to be very very careful that you don't dislodge the catheter because we don't want to have to reinsert and cause the patient any more discomfort than we may already be doing Again, inspect your site for any kind of infiltration, infection, swelling, anything like that. Discard the old bandage, the old dressing. You're going to take the cleanser, that chlorhexidine, and cleanse the site and apply another little bit of skin protectant. Then you're going to just apply a new dressing over the site as directed or as you've done before. Label with your date, time, your initials, <clears throat> and then anchor, anchor it down, anchor the tubing like you've done, and you're going to restart your infusions. <clears throat> Make sure your patient is comfortable, remove any kind of equipment that you may have used, be sure everything's in the trash and cleaned up. Um, if you've used any other PPE, like your gloves and your mask, you can remove it at this point and then perform hand hygiene. And just come back and check on your patients about an hour later. <clears throat>
So to cap the tubing for intermittent use or to flush the site, excuse me, my computer just kind of shut off there. Sorry about that. You're going to want to, one, determine the need for this. Is there an order? Do you need to, is the patient needing to go to the restroom, change their gown, what have you? Be sure you have all your equipment. And much like I've mentioned before, hand hygiene, identify your patient, privacy curtain, all that stuff. You want to assess the site like you have this whole time. Clamp any of the tubing, pause or stop the pump. Technically, you're going to pause or hold it. You don't want to really stop it. Because um, I believe you have to have an order from the doctor in order to stop an infusion. <clears throat> You're going to apply gloves and close the clamp closest to the site. So say my site is here, my clamp is on the tubing right here, this is the one I'm going to clamp. <clears throat> Remove the set, so the connector set, excuse me, from the needleless connector. And then you're, so basically you're just going to twist it right off and lay it to the side. And then you're going to take the antimicrobial swab and swab both ends. Allow it to dry. Put a saline flush on the connector end that's connected to your patient. You want to pull back just a little bit to make sure that there's still blood return. And if so, then you can flush the, use the saline flush to flush the line. And usually you want to do this over the time span of a minute. Okay. If there's any old tubing, you can remove it and reattach after you've cleansed it, you know, as you've done before. Again, remove your equipment, provide patient comfort, hand hygiene, all that good stuff. Pretty much all these things that you do with IV or any kind of infusions, you always want to do hand hygiene before and after, make sure they're comfortable, just all that good stuff. Um, if you're having to change the dressing or flush a central line or a pick line, if you will, it's pretty much the same concept as what I just explained, except you will have to use sterile gloves because their, their pick line is usually here in their neck. You want to use sterile gloves and have a mask on you. Um, you can also ask your patient to turn their head away so like if it's on this side you're going to want them to turn you know um if that if they're not able to turn their head you can offer them a mask as well and then you would just proceed on with the procedure which i kind of found that to be i've actually seen that done before so i was kind of i didn't realize what they were doing at the time though like I've mentioned, you can also use um, intravenous access sites to administer blood transfusions. Now these are a little bit more in-depth, a little bit more time-consuming, if you will. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing you're going to do is you're going to verify your orders like you've been doing, gather any kind of equipment. With the equipment though, you want to make sure that you have an 18 or 20 gauge needle for this just because anything smaller could possibly form a clot and the blood won't flow through and into the patient like it needs to i think most facilities do prefer that you use the 18 gauge though over the 20. <laughs> excuse me again hand hygiene apply any ppe if indicated identify your patients identify yourself if you haven't introduced yourself already Ask if they have any allergies that they're aware of. And curtains for, prim for privacy. Excuse me. Before beginning this, you're going to prime your line. Which is basically, you're going to make sure that there's fluid flowing through it. With normal saline like you have done before. Also, you're going to want to wear gloves. And initiate an IV site if there's not already one there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You want to make sure that your blood products from the bank or wherever your policy says to get the blood from, you want to scan it against the EMAR, which is their medical record. 
to make sure everything matches because again you have to verify orders and this and that however two rns must validate certain info with you and the patient so it can you can be one rn and have another one and the patient has to be or the patient um like their caregiver their their person you have to verify the following the medication order so they have to have an order for blood therapy they have to have signed informed consent you have to verify a patient name patient id number their blood group and type the nurses have to verify expiration dates and inspect they both have to inspect the blood itself for any kind of clots or um, like gas bubbles or anything that's not normal in the blood <clears throat> before you begin anything with the patient you're going to want to obtain what they call baseline vitals so basically say it's 12 o'clock now you're going to want to take all their vital signs that way a little bit later on if you have to redo vitals and you will with blood transfusions um, you have something to kind of compare it against that way if they're if it's getting worse or if it's getting better what have you so if you they already have an IP, IV pump going you're going to want to pause it or put it on hold and close any clamps <clears throat> Remove the cap from the blood product and spike it with the tubing like you did with the, the other solutions. So just pop and hang it. Now to start this infusion, you're going to want to do it slowly, which is generally you're going to do 2 mLs per minute for the first 15 minutes. And you're also going to want to stay with your patient during these first 15 minutes just to make sure that they're not having any adverse reactions like they're, they're, they can't breathe, they're having an, an allergic reaction, anything like that. <clears throat> so to start this infusion, like I said, 2 mLs per minute, you're going to want to open your clamps and set the rate on the pump. And again, assess the flow, assess the patient, do they have any signs or symptoms of infiltration at the site, all these things that we've been doing before. <clears throat> You also want to observe the patient for flushing, itching, hives, because this can be a sign of an allergic reaction, and you'll have to um, intervene as needed. You also, after the first 15 minutes or whatever your policy is at your facility, you want to reassess those vitals and compare them to their baseline. Are they the same? Are they getting better? Are they getting worse? And intervene if needed. If your patient is fine after these 15 minutes, you can increase the rate to what the doctor's order is, but generally you don't want this rate to go more than four hours. Um, and during this four hour period, you want to assess your patient pretty frequently. I believe generally it's like 30 to 60 minutes. At least that's what I would probably do if able. <clears throat> And then once they're done with the infusion, you're just going to disconnect it and discard any of these products like you've done before previously. <clears throat> so some patients may have a port. So these would most typically be like your chemo patients um, or I believe dialysis patients, but I'll have to get back to you on that. But I've most commonly seen it with chemo patients. <clears throat> so first thing you want to do, again, ID your patient, this and that. Um, you're going to want to put a trash can in a convenient location for you to use during this procedure. And adjust your bed to a comfortable working height for you. Make sure your patient is comfortable. Um, much like you did with the central line, you're going to wear a mask ask your patient to turn their head away from the site or if it's easier just you can offer them a mask as well or give them one um you're gonna have a sterile field with sterile supplies on the field so you'll set this up probably like you learned how to do in fundamentals and with clean gloves you don't want to use your sterile ones yet but with clean ones you're going to want to palpate the location of the port <clears throat> 
And I'm kind of doing it right here because my mom has a port, so that's where hers is at. Locate the the location of it, and you're going to see if there's any um, surgical incision. Like, is it a fresh port? Is it a healed port? Um, is there any redness or swelling around it? Just anything that may be uncomfortable for your patient. And at this point, you can remove these gloves because you're going to use other gloves in a minute. <clears throat> And then you can perform hand hygiene at this point if you prefer, or you can just jump right into applying your sterile gloves. <laughs> so you're going to want to connect a needleless connector or an end cap after you have swabbed it with the antimicrobial swabs to your extension tubing. <clears throat> Generally, you're going to also have a 10 ml normal saline flush attached to this. That way you can feel feel, excuse me, fill the tubing with normal saline um, as directed by your facility and apply any kind of clamps that may be needed. So on your patient at this point, you're going to want to cleanse the port with the chlorhexidine um, and usually you're going to go about two to three inches outward from it just to make sure it's completely clean. And then with your non-dominant hand, so for me it's my right hand, <laughs> You're going to want to hold the skin taut after you've palpated for the port. <clears throat> so you're going to kind of hold it, you know, pretty tight. And you want to want to visualize the center of the port. So if they have a double lumen, you're going to want to look for just the center of one of them. Okay, once you've visualized it with your dominant hand, then you can pick up the, the needle and the, the tubing that you just created on the sterile field and at a 90 degree angle so straight in you're going to want to pierce through the skin into the port um the port septum the port lumen however you call it until then you can feel the needle hit the back of the port at, when you feel that you can kind of just lay your tubing there and again if they have a double lumen you'll just repeat that part of the procedure um you will insert three to five mls of that normal saline that's attached to it just to help flush it if, especially if it hasn't been used in a little while it'll help kind of make sure there's good flow through it and this and that but also while you're doing this you're going to observe if, if it's leaking because if it's leaking then it's not in the port so you'll have to remove it and try again with this flush it should flush pretty easily unless it's been a good while that they haven't used it then you may have to use like not not a heparin push, but um, at CAMC it's called a clot buster, is what we what they say it is. You have to use something like that to push it through. <clears throat> um, after you've done the first three to five mLs, you can slowly pull back on that syringe just to assess to make sure you still have flashback or blood return, and if so, you can push the rest of the normal saline through. This should not hurt your patient at all. If there's any discomfort for your patient, please, please, please stop the procedure and kind of give them a minute and maybe even reassess to figure out what went wrong. Okay, and be sure you notify your providers. So at this point, you're going to remove the normal saline syringe and reclamp it if needed, which if it's not connected to their infusion yet, you'll want to reclamp this. Apply the skin protectant around it and apply the dressing like you've done a hundred times probably at this point. Remove any of your equipment, discard your PPE, and then perform hand hygiene. <clears throat> Excuse me. To deaccess this port, so they've already had their infusion, they're ready to go home, they're, they want to be disconnected if you will. You're going to have the same setup as you did before when you first accessed the site. <clears throat> Once you've applied gloves and swabbed your connectors, you're going to attach the normal saline syringe to the extension while it's unclamped. And be sure that you check for any kind of blood return because you want to make sure you still have good flow. Um, you're going to instill that normal saline just to help flush the rest of any kind of medication that may be kind of hanging out in the port. Just push it on through. Remove the syringe. And be sure you do that part over a minute, the flushing. Um, 
just so it's not, I guess, overwhelming to the patient. Reclamp if needed. So then you're going to remove that dressing like you did before when you changed the, the access site here. Be sure you can note if any drainage, bleeding, if the patient has any swelling, and just discard that in the trash. Now, in order to remove the needle and the tubing that is connect, still connected to your patient at this point, you're going to want to stabilize the port to so kind of like, you know, just hold your skin taut and be sure it doesn't move. That's what stabilize means. Um, with the thumb and forefinger of your dominant hand, you're going to grasp the needle, or some of them have what they call wings, needle wings, and in one firm and smooth pull, you're going to just pull it straight out at that 90 degree angle. You may want to warn your patient that this might be a little uncomfortable and be sure that their, their head is turned away from the port. Um, just, just to give them a warning. That's all I can say. And once it's removed from the, the needles removed from the patient, place it in the sharps container, clean them up if they had any kind of bleeding. But you're also going to want to apply gentle pressure with a piece of gauze. And if bleeding or drainage is really prevalent, then you can apply a bandage over it. Um, be sure the patient's comfortable during all this. You can remove their gloves and pretty much send them on their way at this point. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Something that you may commonly hear in the field is what's called an IV bolus or an IV push. Now, this means that there are certain medications that you can give, um, like at a different port in the tubing quickly. <clears throat> Again, with this, you're going to want to make sure you know the, the actions of how it works, nursing considerations, safe dose ranges, what this medication is used for, and any adverse effects of any of the medications that you give, especially ones that you are not familiar with. So, you're going to want to check your orders, check the EMR, everything that you've done before. Okay, perform hand hygiene. Identify your patient. You're going to want to do what's called the three checks, which is you're going to check the medication in your hand, check it on the screen, and check it with like the scanning system that they have. And if you have to, repeat that process. <clears throat> Before giving any medications this way, you're going to assess their IV site for any signs or symptoms of infiltration, swelling, redness like we've been doing <laughs> feel like I'm a broken record at this point you're going to apply gloves and the port that is closest to the patient is the site that you're going to use for this bolus or this push okay so say your site this is your IV site but here's where the closest port is well up here is where you're going to want to clamp it from their current infusion okay <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. First, you're going to flush at that closest site with IV, or not IV, excuse me, with normal saline in the IV, and also check for blood return. If it is positive, you can finish instilling that normal saline, detach it, toss it, then you'll get ready to either insert the syringe or attach the syringe to the um the port site it just kind of depends on what your facility's policy is in order to do that portion and you're going to and just you know slowly give it to them depending on the medication there are some that you can do in one quick push there's others that you may have to do over three to five minutes five to ten minutes or even like pulsate so you do just a little bit of a time over so many repetitions again this is why you have to look up your medications before you give them to your patient be sure that you know what you're giving once you've done this while you're doing it you're going to um, uh, observe your patient for any adverse effects any kind of allergic reactions 
swelling, difficulty breathing, anything like that. Then you're going to detach it, toss it as your protocol. Cause some places you have to put in the sharps container. Some places you can just put straight in the trash. It just, it all just depends. Then you're going to want to, um, flush with normal saline again. So you use saline quite often. Um, remove it, cleanse the port and attach those little like end caps unclamp like you've where you had it clamped and if needed restart the pump if they were already on a pump and then if not you'll just they'll just it'll just flow be sure that once you've restarted your pumps that you are double checking the rate of what it was before you turned it off versus when you've turned it back on or restarted it rather and also whatever the rate is in the orders <clears throat> There's another way to do these bolus or these pushes, and it's through a medication or a drug infusion lock. It's the same procedure as what I just explained before, except instead of using the like little port section, you actually use the lock. Um, and a lot of that, you just have to follow the manufacturer's guidelines on that. So, I hope that this pretty detailed video helped you with learning about IV therapy, how it started, how what you can use with it, or anything like that. All right. Bye, guys.